Hello everyone, this is Clayton Cahan Lust. This is Lecture 5, The Age of Innocence. Uh, in our History 1302 series, U.S. History since 1877. Now, The Age of Innocence is a phrase that comes from the title of a novel written by Edith Wharton. Uh, and what Edith Wharton was talking about in the Age of Innocence is something that's common to us all as human beings. We all have this idea about the past, where we look at the past uh, and we see it for ourselves uh, as a period that is a little bit more wholesome than who we are now. There's less moral ambiguity. We're much more innocent during that period, hence the term Age of Innocence. Uh, it's something that applies to all of our pasts. We apply it, apply it to our personalities because uh, it seems a way uh, of uh, removing our own responsibility uh, from problems that we might have had uh, during childhood or things that might have happened as we were growing up. We apply this phrase, the age of innocence, as a way of pulling our own uh, responsibility out of that equation. Now, nations, just like individuals, have this same sensibility about looking at our past and looking at it and saying that our past was somehow more wholesome. It was somehow more, uh, more innocent. It was somehow less uh, problematic. Uh, hopefully, though, if you've been paying attention for those first, uh, through those first four lectures, you know that this is not an era, this era that this is happening in uh, this early part of U.S. history since 1877. This is anything but less uh, conflict ridden. It's anything le that's uh, it's anything less than a more innocent period. In fact, the same things that we deal with in the modern era uh, have been going on for a very long time. These things have been happening over and over again. Okay, so uh, that's why we're going to talk about this age of innocence. And in talking about the age of innocence, we're going to start off with a person that some of you may have all may have heard of already. Uh, we're going to start off with a man named William Randolph Hearst, pictured on the screen here. In 1898, William Randolph Hearst had sent a photographer to Cuba, essentially with the idea that he was going to foment a war in Cuba. The photographer actually arrived to Cuba. And when he got there, he sent Hearst a telegram, basically telling them that there was nothing there. To, to photograph. There's no war here in Cuba. If any of you have seen uh, the classic film Citizen Kane, this is kind of uh, this is kind of portrayed in the movie Citizen Kane, except instead of William Randolph Hearst, the character is Charles Foster Kane. Uh, and instead of it being a photographer, it's a writer who gets sent down to Cuba to write about the war. But uh, in response to this cable that said that there's nothing here, there's nothing for me to photograph, Hearst is said to have replied, you supply the pictures, I'll supply the war. And whether Hearst did or did not say that, it's indicative of how he uh, viewed the media and how he viewed or how he viewed the role of the media in these sorts of things. Uh, later on, a couple of years later, in response to the poor economic conditions or declining economic conditions in the United States. In 1901, he editorialized in one of his many newspapers that, quote, killing must be done. And one month after that editorial, a, uh, an anarchist uh, assassinated the president of the United States, William McKinley. Now, Hearst didn't look at this and say, oh, my God, I'm responsible for assassinating the president. But he did look at this and say the power of the media is so great that I can say these sorts of things and then people will take independent action uh, on their own and do these sorts of things. So I kind of have to be a little bit more careful about what I'm saying here. The overarching point, Hearst understood the power that media actually has, uh, and he used this power to create the first real media empire. Now, William Randolph Hearst wasn't always like this. He didn't always have this type of power or this sensibility about the responsibility of power. Uh, he had been a true problem child. He had been uh, expelled from virtually every good boarding school in the United States. He'd been expelled from a number of colleges and universities. Uh, most prominently, he'd been expelled from Harvard University uh, when he sent every professor at Harvard University a chamber pot that had their name emblazoned at the bottom uh, of the chamber pot. Uh, his father was an extremely wealthy man. He had made tons of money in the first real serious silver strike in Colorado. So because of that money, 
young William Randolph Hearst never really had to deal with the consequences of his actions. His father constantly got him out of trouble. And at one point, how he got involved in newspapers, at one point, young William thought that running a newspaper, quote, might be fun. So his father bought him a newspaper to run with the idea thinking that, well, maybe this will get him to settle down. Maybe this will be the thing that causes him to grow up and be responsible. And it works. It actually does work. Hearst took this uh, idea of running a newspaper and ran with it. At one point, Hearst is alleged to have said that the newspapers control the nation. Uh, in the 1890s, he established the first true media empire, the Hearst Media uh, Empire that became known as Hearst Newspaper Empire, uh, which uh, an empire that still exists to this day. The uh, we're in Houston, Texas. The Houston Chronicle is part of that Hearst syndicate. Uh, William Randolph Hearst got people to read newspapers again, in large part by being kind of a founder, if you will, of something called yellow journalism, a type of journalism that exaggerates certain aspects of stories, exaggerates the more unsavory parts of stories. Uh, at its worst, yellow journalism you know, simply makes up things. But uh, in its uh, quote, I guess if you want to call it this, it's purest form. Uh, it takes uh, parts of stories that are relatively unimportant, but maybe a little bit salacious. And it exaggerates those at the expense of the less salacious part uh, of the story. Now, yellow journalism is going to be responsible for a spike in newspaper uh, industries. In 1865, at the end of the Civil War, there were about 500 newspapers in the United States with a circulation of about 2 million readers. So it's not a terribly big industry during this era. Uh, and if you were to go to the library or to any sort of, uh, it, forget going to the library, you can go to any search engine and start pulling up old newspapers. Newspapers from the 1800s were very text heavy uh, newspapers. They had just lots of columns of text in them. Uh, so they were boring to read. They were incredibly informative. I don't want to give you the wrong impression, but they're just not exciting to read. Uh, so a lot of people didn't really care about these newspapers. But by the, 19, by the time the turn of the century rolled around, by 1900, William Randolph Hearst had done something that, uh, that people just didn't think was possible. He got people interested in reading newspapers. Look at the difference. In just 35 years, there were now 2,000 newspapers with a circulation of 15 million readers. Okay, That's not something that we can just attribute to population growth uh, or something along those lines. This is a massive growth in people deciding we want to read the newspaper. Now, uh, the this also has another effect. Uh, the newspapers uh, and the growth in the industry makes Hearst incredibly wealthy and powerful, uh, but not by not. It's not being generated. The money is not being generated in the newspaper. Newspapers during that era sold for about a penny per copy. So just like today for the newspapers that are still in existence, they don't make money being sold on the corners or in newsstands. Newspapers that do make money make money in advertising, not uh, in their uh, just in their readership. Uh, the idea here is that they sell advertising space to companies that want to get a product out there or want to get a specific viewpoint out there. And the newspaper can promise uh, readership. And the more readers they provide, the greater revenue uh, or the greater rates they can charge in their advertising, which brings more revenue to the newspaper or media company. Now, the way to do this, the way to get eyeballs on the newspaper, uh, Hearst understood this very early on. Uh, he and a competitor of his, uh, a guy named Joseph Pulitzer, who's pictured on the screen here, gave those people what they wanted. Uh, they started utilizing banner headlines like the one that you see on the screen here. It's not perfectly in time with what we're doing. This is obviously uh, a newspaper from the 1940s, but it's a really good example of a banner headline, one that takes up the entirety of the, uh, of the top of the newspaper. Uh, political cartoons and uh, and entertaining humorous cartoons are going to be a new part of these uh, newspapers because, after all, the idea 
is to entertain the readers. The, you entertain more people, you get more people coming in uh, the doors, so to speak, or buying the newspaper in this case. We see the introduction of the first sports pages in newspapers during this era as people are going to, again, they're going to be paying to, to know, to be informed about what's going on with local sports teams. And then Pulitzer and Hearst also understood something that everybody in media understood then and now that when nothing else sells sex and scandal will absolutely sell it will always sell and and bring eyes to the product now hearst got his way uh he got this stuff done by telling people by telling the reporters that he employed that their job was not to report the news but rather their job was to make the news. And the peak of William Randolph Hearst's empire was in the 1890s, which just so happens to be the period that we're covering in today's lecture. In the 1890s, Cuba was rebelling against Spain, and Hearst saw a great opportunity in this uh, rebellion. He hired a novelist, a down-on-his-luck novelist named Stephen Crane, to go and write about what was going on. Now, I say down-on-his-luck novelist, but he was also a fairly famous novelist. Uh, but he hired Crane to go and write about what was going on. Uh, he hired Frederick Remington to go and paint uh, landscapes about what's going on in Cuba. He even hired a relatively unknown British naval officer named Winston Churchill to keep, Pul to keep himself and thus his readers uh, up to date on what was going on with the war. So uh, he had sort of an embedded journalist, if you will, to use modern terminology in all of this. All of this would ensure on some level that Hearst's readers will get the full story and they'll get it before anyone else. The problem is, as I mentioned with the, uh, the story at the, at the top of all of this stuff, everybody's going to Cuba and coming up with the same answer. There's nothing to write about. There's nothing to draw about. There's nothing to report on. So Pul or excuse me, so Hertz, Hearst gives it to him. Hearst winds up coming into some intelligence that the 17-year-old daughter of one of the leaders of the Cuban rebellion had been rounded up and put into a prison camp in Cuba. These were uh, the first concentration camps uh, in the United in uh, in uh, American history, uh, the first real designated concentration camps in American history uh, happening in Cuba. Uh, they were absolutely done in the same way. The general in charge of the of putting down the Cuban rebellion got to Cuba and said, there's too many people here for me to keep an eye on. So I'm just going to round up everybody. I'm going to put them in these camps. I'm going to concentrate the population. And by doing so, I'm going to be able to say, okay, these people are in these camps, so they can't be causing the problem. So anybody who's not in the camps, they're obviously the criminals. They're obviously the ones who are going out and causing all the trouble. So he had kidnapped one, of, or he had, I shouldn't say kidnapped. He had actually arrested one of the daughters of one of the leaders of the rebellion. Well, Hearst thought this would make a great story if he could get this daughter out of the prison camp. So Hearst assembled a team of private commandos. He sent them to the precise location where the prison encampment was, where this concentration camp actually was, told them they are to get this girl out. They are to break the prison camp open and get her out and anybody else that they can get out to, that would be great. And then Hearst also told his reporters on the scene so that they knew before everybody else knew. So when the story gets told, when the story gets reported in the newspapers here in the United States, Hearst isn't telling them the other side, which is, oh, and by the way, I paid these guys to go and break this girl out. The thing that Americans are told, uh, that um, United States citizens are told is, is that this rebellion has broken out that the, one of the daughters of the leaders was kidnapped by this, you know, this heinous general, and she was broken out by this team of commandos that risked their lives. And, you know, we knew about it first. We were first on the scene. So if you want to be uh, informed about up-to-date topics, if you want to know what's really going on, you read Hearst newspapers and not everybody else's newspapers. And it absolutely worked. Because of stuff like this and because of the rebellion that develops and the United States involvement in the war that's involved with this rebellion, Hearst was able to tout the new, his newspapers, as he put it, as a force for democracy. 
Now, this is just one of the things that's going on in the year, uh, in the, the period of the 1890s, in 1898, uh, in this case specifically. This is one of those things that's going on. But the 1890s mark a really distinct shift in American history. This is a moment where we can see the old era, the old stuff about the United States, an old way of living and doing things. All of that stuff is out the window. And we start to see the development of the modern age in the United States. So the 1890s aren't just a precursor from the standpoint, it's from a linear standpoint in terms of the 1890s come directly before the 20th century. It's not just that, it's also a figurative uh, lead in to the, the 20th century. It's a figurative lead in to modernity because all of the stage for everything that happens in the 20th century is being set in the 1890s. And if we look at what's happening, why the 20th century is such a huge deal, why it's so important, think about the following. The 20th century represents 1% of all time in our history. Okay, history is said to have begun, quote unquote, with the development of agriculture. And the 20th century represents 1% of all recorded time. And yet there's more happening in that 100 year span of the 20th century than in all of the previous centuries combined. It is the 20th century is given a number of nicknames. It's called the American century because it's the century where the United States comes to quote unquote dominate global discourse and global trade and uh, imperialism and all these other sorts of things. So it's called the American century. Uh, it's uh, also called the century of modernity. Uh, it's also very much a century of extremes because we see the extreme of all elements of human behavior. We're going to see an incredibly horrific amount of brutality and violence in the 20th century. But we're also going to see an unbelievable amount of inventiveness within the 20th century. We're going to see an unparalleled humanitarianism uh, in an attempt to counteract some of that brutality and violence. To give you an idea of what I'm talking about with this stuff, uh, during World War II, the uh, American Red Cross asked Americans to contribute uh, in an unprecedented way to global relief efforts, uh, in particular to get food and medical supplies uh, to all of these parts of war-torn Europe. And in doing so, they gave every big city in the country a quote-unquote subscription saying that based on your population and based on certain demographic factors, this is how much you should be able to raise for as a charitable, charitable donation to the Red Cross. The city of Houston managed to raise its quote unquote quota, its annual quota. It raised that quota in four days. Okay. So it was incredibly uh, humanitarian in that regard. We see a massive amount of technological advances during the 20th century. We see the development of all so sorts of new ideologies and the implementation of new ideologies, fascism is going to de develop. Uh, totalitarian communism is going to be implemented for the first time uh, in the 20th century. There are going to be all sorts of efforts at uh, anarchism uh, and uh, what's called anarcho-syndicalism being put into place. There are going to be a lot of challenges globally to the idea of empire, to the ideas of pure market capitalism. They're not so much in the United States, but these uh, ideologies are absolutely going to be uh, developing, uh, especially globally during this period. There's going to be an unequaled amount of wealth and knowledge created during the 20th century, but there's also going to be unimaginable savagery. And if we kind of bookend those two things, the savagery uh, plus that horrific brutality and violence that I started this particular slide with, think about the following. During the 1900s, the 20th century, 50 million plus died in wars. And then we had millions more die in genocides, concentration camps, government-induced famines all across the globe 
during that 20th century. So it, it really is a century of the masses. We see mass communications. We see mass markets. We see mass consumption being developed. We see mass murder being developed. So it really is a century of the masses. Uh, there's another nicer way to put this, if you want to think of it this way. It's a revolutionary uh, century uh, as well. So how can we see revolutionary change in all of this? Uh, one way, I think, is to look at what life was like at the turn of the century, in the, uh, particularly in the United States. Uh, now, I certainly wouldn't advise you to try to take notes uh, and try to take all of this stuff down that you see on the screen here. Uh, I am going to remind you that you have access to the PowerPoints. So if you're dying to have this as a list and to look at, you can always download the PowerPoints and, and just take this and say, oh, here it is here. I've got it. But for now, just listen to these things. Listen to what life was like at the turn of the century. The life expectancy in 1900 for uh, whites across virtually all demographic spectrums uh, for whites, it was 55 to 57. As I mentioned uh, in a previous lecture, for African Americans, it was 33. Okay, so a huge difference uh, amongst those two groups demographically. But compared to today, for men, it's 74. Uh, for women, it's 79 uh, across all of these different spectrums. So obviously, a totally different life expectancy. One out of every four children died by the age of five. Okay, one out of every four, that's an infant mortality rate of 25% in the United States. So that's a, that's a huge, huge problem. If a child lived to the age of 18, uh, they had a more than 50% chance that at least one of their parents uh, was dead. The average income in the United States is $300 in 1900. Now that's going to fluctuate and it's going to kind of, there's going to be these boom and bust periods where the uh, the wage will go up and go down, but in 1900, it's $300 per year. Half of all children in the United States lived in what the government defined as poverty. Uh, in 1900, most, uh, most people uh, did not have indoor plumbing. There were virtually no phones, uh, almost no cars. Uh, we're going to talk about this later, but uh, there, I, I think the numbers were that there's a grand total of 8,000 cars in the United States, and nobody west of the Mississippi actually owned cars. So all of those were east of the Mississippi River. So it's a totally different way of looking or of living life than the way that we do today. Most teenagers in the United States uh, did not attend high school. The national graduation rate was only about 2%. Uh, where most people, what most teenagers did was they worked outside the home for wages out of, out of pure economic necessity, they worked for wages. Uh, and this isn't like, uh, you know, this, this isn't like, you know, students going and getting jobs so that they can help their parents out a little bit, pay for school supplies, or maybe save up for the car they want or, uh, or an Xbox or something like that. This is a matter of if these teenagers are not going out to work and contributing to the family's income pool, the family simply does not survive. So their, their work and their wages are absolutely critical to their family's survival. The city of Toledo, Ohio in 1900 was a much bigger city and way more important to the United States economy than Los Angeles, California, or Dallas or Houston, Texas. They were kind of blips, if you will, uh, on the nation's uh, economy. Three-fifths, that's 60% of all Americans, lived on farms. Now, we've been talking about the development of agribusiness uh, in the previous lectures, but still, most people in this country lived on farms. Today, it's really a, a dying sort of family type of structure. Fewer than 1% of Americans actually live on farms uh, today. So this is a huge change. Uh, the top five names for boys in this era were John, William, James, George, and Charles. And for girls, among the top five names uh, were Bertha and Florence. So again, naming conventions are completely different. Uh, as much as we've talked about certain industries and the wealth that, were that was generated 
by those industries. Um, still among the top 10 industries were things like boot making and the production of malt liquor. So the United States economy was not the economy that we think of uh, today. It certainly wasn't uh, a service oriented economy. It wasn't really even uh, a hugely manufacturing giant either during this era. 95% of all births took place in the home at the turn of the century, as opposed to a hospital or a birthing clinic. Today, it's flip-flopped. It's completely the opposite. The overwhelming majority of births take place in a hospital or in a birthing clinic, and the overwhelming minority, if you will, take place in the home. And then the final aspect, I guess, uh, this is one of my uh, favorite ones because in person of the reaction uh, that it provokes. Most people in the United States washed their hair one time per month. And the reason they didn't do it, the reason they didn't do it more often than not, uh, was they the only real soap, if you will, of this era was a product called borax, which is an incredibly uh, harsh detergent. So you would not want to use that on your hair. So most people used it only once per month. Uh, and then they cut it uh, with water or egg yolks or beer, or they simply cut out the borax entirely and used the egg yolks and the beer to wash oil out of their hair or to rinse oil out of their hair. And otherwise they just put up uh, with whatever oil uh, there was in their hair until they just couldn't stand it anymore. So there, uh, and for those of you who are wondering, well, why didn't they just use shampoo? Well, shampoo hadn't actually been invented yet. So they couldn't actually use that. So this is a different world, but this world, how, however, became our world. Now, uh, what we're going to do now, we're going to shift focus again for the class a little bit, and we're going to be talking some more about revolutions. Uh, and more precisely, what we're going to be talking about is the revolutionary change that allows this world that you're looking at on your screen to become the world that we actually live in. Okay, And I say revolutionary change for an important reason. A lot of times when we talk about revolutions, uh, in this world. When we talk about revolutions, we think of the risings of people and we think of violence, like in the American Revolution or the French Revolution or the Soviet Revolution. But the revolutions, the important revolutions of the 20th century were revolutions, a revolving way that people exist. It's a, a revolution, it's a change in their circumstance. Okay, as opposed to a violent uprising. So we're going to look at those types of revolutions. These revolutions take place without bloodshed, but they're often the more important revolutions. Now, the first revolution we're going to look at is a transportation revolution. This is going to be the big, uh, the big revolution. Uh, in 1903, Henry Ford, pictured on the screen, was a 40-year-old engineer working for his father, and he had just quit his job with his father to manufacture cars. Now, this was something that virtually everybody who knew Henry Ford told him was a mistake. They told him he was stupid to do this, that there's no way he's going to succeed, that cars are pointless. And Ford was convinced, no, they're not pointless. They can be incredibly useful. They have a, an incredible amount of utility if we can demonstrate it properly. So what he does is he starts raising money. He starts Built, he says he's going to build this incredibly powerful and fast race car to demonstrate the utility of automobiles. And he raises money, he's building up uh, all of this capital. Uh, and his car, his race car that he builds, got up to a phenomenal 80 miles per hour. Now, that's phenomenal for today, for then. Uh, I'm sure some of you hit 80 miles an hour on a regular basis on the freeways. So it's not incredibly remarkable today, but in 1903, it's an insane amount of speed. Because of the speed he was able to get, it convinced a lot of people to, do, to invest in the company that became the Ford Motor Company because the speed had demonstrated the utility, the ability to, to move across larger spaces at that speed demonstrated the utility of automobiles. So they bought in. They said, all right, we're going to give you money and you go out and you build cars. Now, Ford does this. He's going to start building his first production model. And he's going to give every single test model a letter. He starts out with the Ford Model A. 
doesn't like it. Says it's not going to work. It's not going to be produced quickly enough or efficiently enough. People aren't going to like this. It's going to break down too much, all that sort of stuff. So he scraps the Model A, starts off uh, with a new model, gives it the test letter B. All the way along the alphabet, A, B, C, D. He wasn't satisfied with what he produced until he got to the letter T in the alphabet. And in 1908, Ford announces the production of the Model T Ford from the Ford Motor Company. Now, he announces that this car is going into production for the people, for the masses. And he says, uh, and he wrote this in his own biography, his own autobiography. The Model T Ford is the only car we're going to be producing. There are no options to it. You know, you, you, if you want to customize it, you customize it after the after market. We're not customizing it on our in our facilities for you. And you could have it, quote, in any color you want, as long as the color is black end quote. Now, there's a reason he's doing this, not because he's going, you'll take the car that I make uh, and like the car that I make. The reason for this is, the reason Ford did this, was that he had what he referred to as a quote-unquote democratic faith. Ford did not want to buy a car that was, or build a car, excuse me, that was flashy, that was expensive to produce, that was time-consuming to produce. And the reason for that is simple. He said, if I do that, only the wealthy will be able to afford these cars. And that's not what I'm trying to do here. That democratic faith was about making sure that the masses, the consuming masses, can actually afford the Model T. That's why no options. That's why no changes in color of the car or anything like that. This is this car. This is it. And we're going to build the same car over and over and over and over and over and over again. Now, what Ford called this was the dynamic principle of mass production. And you can see that here on the screen, the dynamic principle of mass production. Henry Ford puts this in place as a way of saying, if we can do this, if we build the same car over and over and over and over and over, we become better at doing that. We become more efficient at doing that. And it brings the cost to produce the car down. Okay. And if you bring the cost down, the cost of making the car down, you also bring retail prices down as well. That's what's embodied in the dynamic principle of mass production. If you produce more goods, it becomes cheaper to produce subsequent goods. Okay. And Ford can look at the bottom line and say, this worked. In 1913, to help aid with this dynamic principle of mass production, Ford established the first assembly line. And in doing so, he got that cost down even further. In 1909, the first, the Model T, cost $950 to manufacture. In 1913, with the establishment of the assembly line, he got the cost down to $290. In 1924, it was down to $250. Okay. And Ford was selling these cars at a markup, but his idea was if I get the cost down, the markup doesn't need to be as great. And people were telling Ford, this is the dumbest way to do this. You need to be charging people more per unit. But Ford argued that you'll make up for the lower prices in volume sales. And again, if you look at how many Model Ts were sold, which I'm, don't get me wrong, I'm not going to test you on these things. But look in 1909, 18,000 Model Ts were sold uh, at essentially at a cost of $950 with a modest markup. In 1924, though, the Ford Motor Company sold one and a quarter million Model Ts. Okay at a $250 cost with modest markup. So obviously he's making a ton of money. He's making way more money in 1924 than he is in 1909, okay? Because the car is easier to produce, it's cheaper to produce, which allows him to still make money, but not make it out of the reach of the average consumer. 
Now, Ford also had this idea that if you pay your workers better, this will help affect the broader economy. Okay? Ford understood something about the economy, that if you have workers who are paid better, they buy more stuff. Okay? The average pay for a nine-hour workday in the United States in 1909 was $2.40 a day for a nine-hour workday. Okay, that was the average pay for industrial workers in the United States. $2.40 a day for a nine-hour workday. Ford came in and started paying his workers $5 a day for an eight-hour workday. This means the average worker for Ford saw their salary literally double. Now, think about your own personal conditions, your own individual circumstances, and think about what you would do with money if your income all of a sudden doubled. Just like that, it doubled. Think about what you would do. Now, some of you might go, I'd be able to pay off some bills. I could set up a savings account. I could set up a college account for my kids or something like that. Or you could do what is expected here. What Ford was trying to get through to people was your salary has doubled. So now you can buy more stuff. If you, your salary doubles, you should go out and you should buy a bigger TV or you should buy an Xbox or you should buy those virtual reality goggles that you always wanted, or you should buy a better computer, or on and on and on. If your salary doubles, you should consume more stuff. Ford understood that if workers are paid better, they consume more stuff. That means retail inventories decline. That means those retailers then have to go to their wholesalers and tell them, we need you to produce more stuff to restock our shelves, or we need you to get more stuff to restock our shelves. The wholesalers will then go to the manufacturers and say, we need you to produce more stuff so that we can fill all these retail orders that we have. The manufacturers will go, well, we've got to increase our production. So we need to increase our workforce. So all of these things work together in a sort of uh, symbiotic way. They're all kind of mutually dependent as Ford saw it. So paying his workers is the first step in all of this stuff. Now, it worked, and it worked dramatically well for Henry Ford. Uh, it, it, uh, it worked very well for him and made him one of the wealthiest men in the world. But it also left him with some challengers. And among those challengers was a guy named Alfred Sloan, who owned a company called General Motors. General Motors had a wholly different idea than the Ford Motor Company did. And Alfred Sloan was hell-bent on beating Ford at his own game. Now, what Alfred Sloan believed was that people wanted prestige more than they wanted sort of functionality, if you will. Ford is the functional car. It gets you from point A to point B in an efficient way. And there's no frills to it. Remember, it's no options. It's the same color. And it's any colors you, you want as long as it's black. It's not designed to look flashy. It's designed to work. That 1909 Model T Ford that I referenced on the last page, the 1909 Model T and the 1924 Model T, the only difference is when they're made. Okay, They're the same car over and over and over and over again. You're not going to see Model Ts going down the street and see people going, wow, that's a great looking car. Sloan believes that that's what people actually want. They want prestige. They want to be able to drive down the street and have people go, wow, what's that that's looking, that's going down the street? He believes that people want that prestige so much that they will pay for it. So one of the first things that he does is he says, but we're going to customize our automobiles. We're not going to do the same car over and over again. We'll have a base model, sure, but we expect our customers to customize. That means the price is going to go up. But that's fine, Sloan says, because what we will do is we will use the new idea of consumer credit. We'll give people loans in order to buy our cars, as opposed to saying, well, the car is $300. So if you've got $300, you can buy this car. So we're going to offer loans. We're going to take advantage of that consumer credit as opposed to reduced prices. Sloan is also going to implement an idea called planned obsolescence. Now, in the automobile industry, it's kind of it's the basis 
for model year turnover, that the car that is produced in 2015 is fine for 2015, but in 2017, the company is going to dramatically overhaul the car. They're going to put new options on it. They're going to offer new paint. They're going to new offer new lighting packages. In 2020, they'll do a complete redesign, so it won't even look the same with the idea that people are going to be perfectly happy with the car they have, but then they're going to go, I like that one, and I will not stop until I've got that car. There is probably nothing wrong with the car that they have, but that other one over there looks much nicer. That's the idea behind planned obsolescence. The car that you have is built to be replaced. Replaced not because something went wrong with it, not because it's going to finally fail, but because the other one looks cooler or has some functionality that you you like that the old one doesn't. We see this in the computer industry. We see it in the gaming industry. We see it in all sorts of different types of industries, this idea of planned obsolescence. And then Alfred Sloan is also going to utilize this idea of prestige, and he's going to, div going to divide General Motors into different companies that present a different image with each one of the cars. And the idea that Sloan had, this doesn't work out perfectly for, for particularly long because uh, the idea of consumer credit is gonna mean that you may not be where you need to be in life, but you can certainly you know, overextend yourself from a credit perspective uh, and get the car that you want. But Sloan's idea behind dividing the company into these five models was is that if you, have your first job, uh, you're an, it's an entry-level position, and you all know the types of positions uh, that I'm talking about here. Entry-level positions where the most important thing you can do to be, quote, good at your job is to be there, is to be there and be on time, to be reliable. So you need reliable transportation. Well, that's what the Chevy will actually do for you. The Chevy will give you that reliable transportation, the basic point A to point B transportation. The thought behind Pontiac was, is that once you've gotten your first promotion or your first big raise, you're going to see your station in life go up a little bit. So you need to increase your prestige a little bit. So you go out and you buy a Pontiac. Uh, for those of you who don't remember when Pontiacs were uh, around, Pontiacs were literally the same car as Chevy's. The difference was that there were different trim packages, different lighting packages, different colors that were offered. Uh, in some cases, uh, like one of the first cars I had, uh, you could actually get the Pontiac model of that car. You could get it in purple, but you couldn't get the Chevy model of that car in purple, which was, you know, I was young, I was stupid, and I was like, a purple car, that'd be pretty cool. Well, you can't get it with the Chevy, but you can by upgrading to the Pontiac. Now, the thought behind Oldsmobile, this is your basic middle management car. You get your first real true promotion where you're actually in charge of a few people and you the thought is is you go you've got to go out and demonstrate that you have hit this status point in life you're going to buy an oldsmobile and you should buy an oldsmobile the argument went because the people who work for you drive pontiacs and chevys and you don't want to be confused for one of those guys when you start reaching upper management that's when you buy a buick it's got a little bit more of a high-end, again, high-end trim packages. It looks a little bit better. It's a little bit more flashy. And then the pinnacle, when you reach the very top, or if you're at a point uh, where you're ready to retire and go off and enjoy the rest of your life in retirement, that's when you go out and you buy the Cadillac because the Cadillac is considered to be the ultimate achievement. So with this, I know I've kind of done this in a sort of backwards way on the screen here, but as you go up, as your station in life increases, the car that you drive also uh, becomes more, uh, more specialized, more, uh, more important uh, in demonstrating who you actually are. Uh, this winds up having a huge effect on uh, automobile culture in the United States. Uh, one of the big things that it does is in 1928, Ford finally scrapped the Model T uh, and started introducing newer models to compete with General Motors, and Henry Ford also wound up listening to his son and adopting consumer credit uh, as part of the purchasing process because his son kind of basically told him, look, there's no other choice here. We have to increase the prices uh, 
uh, of our cars if we have any chance of competing with General Motors. So these two guys are going to be responsible for creating this boom in automotives uh, and cars in the United States. Our second revolution, if you will, is a scientific revolution. The 1890s and the, uh, the dawn of a new century marked the beginning of modern science. X-rays were developed during this era. Atomic particles were discovered. These are going to change the way uh, scientists think about explaining the world around us. The quantum theory of mechanics is developed uh, during the 1890s. Uh, medicine is going to see tremendous advances and is probably going to be the biggest beneficiary of this scientific revolution. Pasteurization, for example, is going to be discovered and, by the, uh, and developed. And by virtue of that, it's going to lead to an enormous drop in the infant mortality rate. People, people could realistically start thinking about their children and saying, you know, it's not uncommon to have all of these children and have all of them live. And I know that's kind of a strange thing for us to hear in 2022. But again, different worlds in 2022 versus, say, 1892. There are going to be laboratory-based uh, medicine pursuits during this era that are going to benefit from all of these new scientific de uh, developments. Uh, they're going to do things like cure yellow fever, diphtheria, meningitis. Why this is important, this is again one of those big social changes, uh, whether you realize it or not. This changes the way people see doctors, it changes the way people see hospitals and even uh, the idea of medicine here. Prior to the 1890s, people looked at doctors as people who were, for the most part, charlatans. They didn't really know much more than anybody else. Uh, there weren't, for a lot of the 1800s, there weren't professional standards for doctors. So people went to doctors as kind of a last resort, and they absolutely saw hospitals as a place of last resort. Most people in the 1800s said, you know, hospitals are where you go to die. You don't go to hospitals. You don't go to doctors to get better. But now, courtesy of all of these scientific revolutions, medicine understands the world better. They understand how diseases develop better. So they're able to come up with cures, which convinces people, well, maybe these guys can actually cure people. Maybe they're not who you go to to make it easier to die. Maybe they can actually make you get better. Okay. So big time revolution in, uh, in science here. There's a big change in mass communication. In, uh, especially in the 1890s, we see the explosion of mass communications and mass entertainment. Now, one of the big changes is going to be telephone usage. The telephone was actually invented in 1876. Uh, and in the United States, uh, Americans give credit to uh, Alexander Graham Bell for this. Uh, but there were a grand total of, uh, of two uh, telephones uh, in the United States in that 1876 moment. There was not an explosion of telephones. Even into the 1890s, while it got kind of turned into a little bit of a bigger circumstance, there were still so, so few telephones in the United States that you could actually call somebody by name. You didn't have to have a phone number. You didn't actually call up uh, a number. You didn't dial in a number uh, or punch in a number. You actually picked up an earpiece and clicked what was called a receiver, which would connect you with an operator. And you could say, I want to talk to Clayton Lust. And the operator would go, okay, uh, there's Clayton Lust. And they'd plug in a cord and connect you to Clayton Lust. That's how it worked. There were that few phone numbers. However, starting in the 1900s, people started, again, to see the utility of this type of communication. A big part of it was when the president of the United States had a telephone installed at the White House. Now people are going, well, if the president sees this as an important type of communication, maybe so can we. So all of a sudden you see this explosion in, tele uh, in telephones and the invention of things like telephone numbers and incredible expansion uh, of telephone wires being put up and all of that sort of stuff. The 1890s also saw the invention of billboards and modern advertising. Prior to, uh, uh, prior to the 1890s, 
There was no magazine in this country that had a circulation of greater than 1 million. For the most part, magazines in this country were aimed at wealthy people in this country uh, who had quote unquote elite tastes. But in 1900, a guy named Edward Bach founded a magazine called the Ladies Home Journal with an immediate circulation of 850,000. So it was almost right off the bat, one of the largest magazines in the United States. And it also wound up very quickly surpassing a, uh, the 1 million subscriber mark. But why it was so powerful, why it was so popular here was that Bach was not aiming this magazine at wealthy people. He said, this magazine is going to address the average everyday housewife in the United States. And if you're not aware of this, you should be aware of this. It's a given. There's more average everyday people than there are wealthy people. So if you aim at the marketplace in the correct way, you're going to make a lot of money by addressing the average everyday person. Uh, William Randolph Hearst and uh, Joseph Pulitzer are also going to form a new, create a new type of newspaper called uh, the tabloid newspaper. Now today, when we hear the word tabloid, uh, what it kind of gives us the impression of is it's, you know, magazines like the National Enquirer or Weekly World News. But tabloid, tabloid, excuse me, is actually kind of a format as opposed to a style of journalism. The tabloid was invent was created as a way to make it easier and more concise to print the news. Instead of reading it in what's called a top fold newspaper, uh, the top fold newspaper is what most of us picture when we think of a newspaper. It's all folded over and you have to take it out and you, the bottom drops. And then when you, you know, you read it, you open the pages up, it opens it up in this, you know, you know, big format. A tabloid newspaper was meant to read like a magazine reads. So it's much more you know, it's much more compact. The reason for that is you have a lot more people leaving the home. You have a lot more people going to uh, industrial jobs. They're riding trains and commuter transit, and they're packed onto these trains and, uh, and trolleys and later on buses. So they need a form of newspaper that's more compact to read, one that just takes up the space that they're in, as opposed to taking up all of this space like a top fold newspaper does. So the tabloid magazine uh, or the tabloid newspaper is about is again it's about form as opposed to uh, the actual journalism itself. A, another uh, publisher named Frank Doubleday invents something called the bestseller during this era. Doubleday's idea with the best-selling novel uh, is is that instead of actually selling the story, rather than selling the the book itself and saying that the uh, the story is important. You market the author. You market the author as some sort of a genius or an expert on something. Uh, and he tries this with an author named Jack London uh, and a novel called Call of the Wild. The way Doubleday printed this was he printed it in excerpt form in tabloid newspapers so that people could get a little taste of it and go, wow, this, this, this uh, Jack London is an incredible writer. He's got just this really vivid way of telling stories. And Doubleday started marketing Jack London like that, not about, you know, well, you read the story that's this incredible story of courage and blah, blah, blah. It's about read the latest story from Jack London. Uh, and again, this idea of the bestseller is something that continues into this day, uh, you know, to, to greater or lesser degrees. I mean, think about how we think about authors like Stephen King. Nobody really cares what Stephen King has written when, a, when, when one of his books comes out. When it's marketed, it's marketed as the latest novel from Stephen King. We're not going to tell you what it's about. Just know it's by Stephen King. So, you know, you know, it's good. Or, you know, pick any other author that you want to think of in that regard if you don't like the Stephen King analogy. But the point is you're selling and marketing the novelist, the author, as opposed to the story that they've actually written. We also see as a huge part in this mass communications boom uh, is the use of uh, modern competitive and uh, team sports uh, during this year. They're starting to arise. They're becoming incredibly popular, not necessarily from a participation standpoint, but from a viewer standpoint, from the standpoint of people consuming that sport. Uh, we see James Naismith during this period uh, inventing the, uh, the sport of basketball at a 
uh, at a YMCA gym in Massachusetts. Uh, colleges and uh, colleges began in, uh, fielding uh, the first football teams during this era. We're going to see also an upsurge in spectators watching uh, wrestling, uh, professional wrestling, golf, boxing, baseball. We see this development of new types of baseball fields uh, during this era, era. Most of the time, baseball fields during this era were very small. They didn't have a ton of seating. Uh, the largest baseball stadium prior to 1900 seated about 3,000 people. But all of a sudden, there's this surge in free time. There's a surge in a demand to be entertained and all of a sudden baseball teams start building these much bigger stadiums uh, to increase the capacity because now all of a sudden there's a demand to actually see these games. So there's a huge change uh, in mass communications. Uh, those who can't get a ticket, the only way they're going to be able to follow it and quote consume the sport is to consume it through the newspaper uh, and through the media. So it helps push this idea of mass communications forward. We're going to see, uh, as another revolution, we're going to see a change in living standards in the United States. They are going to be changed dramatically. Uh, as I mentioned, there were only 8,000 cars in the United States, but that doesn't mean that people walked everywhere. Uh, there were still, even in the nation's biggest cities like New York and San Francisco and Los Angeles uh, and uh, Philadelphia, there were th millions of horses in the nation's cities. And they walked around the same streets that people walked around. They walked around the same streets that cars drove in. And those horses deposited tons of urine and feces on the streets every single day, uh, which created a health crisis because we don't have the same, uh, the same situation of street cleaners and street sweepers that we do today. Uh, in a lot of the nation's cities, uh, there either had to be uh, a good Samaritan who would come out and kind of shovel that stuff away, or the population was like, well, the rain will get it. and Hopefully the rain's going to be coming soon. Uh, but otherwise, it, that stuff just kind of sat there. Uh, and, you know, urine in particular would soak into the groundwater. Uh, so people who had wells were in real trouble. Uh, people who bought well water were in trouble. Uh, people who were walking through the nation's streets, breathing all of that stuff. Uh, had real trouble. It's kind of indicative of the lack uh, or the lower uh, lowered living standards that more people died of cancer, uh, excuse me, of tuberculosis than cancer during this era. And if we look at the top three causes of death in the United States in 1800, all three of them, pneumonia, influenza, and tuberculosis are all related to substandard living conditions in the nation's cities. This is going to absolutely change with the increased of cars on the nation's streets, the numbers of horses are going to uh, change as well. There's also a major sexual revolution in the United States. In 1900, this is not just a sexual revolution from the standpoint of sexual standards, uh, but there's also a change in gender standards and behavioral standards uh, and what the roles of women are. So it's all kind of tied up in this sexual revolution. In 1900, the typical American woman wore 20 to 25 pounds worth of clothing every single day between, between undergarments, foundation garments, the actual dress that they wore. Uh, and that doesn't even include a top coat. And if one were a proper lady, she absolutely wore a top coat during this era. You can imagine that a lot of these women were quite literally, physically immobilized as a result of this. Uh, but it's also a symbolic mob, uh, immobilization here. Uh, the reason I say it's literal, I mean, think about uh, we're, you know, here in Houston, Texas, think about what life would be like in 1900 in Houston, Texas. You start hitting July and August in Houston, and it's 99, 100 degrees every single day, 98% humidity every single day. If you're wearing 25 pounds worth of clothing because you're proper, you don't want to move around. You're not interested in moving around. You're not going, I think today is a wonderful day for a stroll. It's even less of a wonderful day for going out and politicking and demanding change for women. Okay. So women were symbolically immobilized as well here. Uh, women only voted 
in four states in the United States. And those four states were out in the West and they only participated in state elections. So women could not vote in anything but four states. If we look at their professions that they're allowed to join, uh, and I do say allowed to join, only 1% of doctors and lawyers were women. Uh, and in part, that's because there was kind of a new idea emerging that there were professional standards and professional uh, tests to take during this era. That was only recently uh, developing. And groups like the American Bar Association just put it in their in their charter that you know you had to be a man to take these things because it was beyond their comprehension that a woman could actually go to law school and pass uh, the the studies and then come in and take the bar exam and pass the bar exam it was just beyond their comprehension. So they simply forbid women from doing this. They forbid women from becoming law uh, doctors as well in a lot of these states. Uh, another very important change is a, uh, a survey of sexual attitudes that was done in both 1910 uh, and 1920. The 1910 survey uh, suggested uh, that it was very rare for women to engage in quote unquote premarital sexual activity. Now, that doesn't mean that women weren't. You can probably imagine that when you've got a person giving you this sort of survey, that a lot of women during this era, even if they were doing things, would simply lie about it. But that's the important change here. When the survey was redone in 1920, after you know we've got this first one done in 1910, then a second one done in 1920, when the second survey came out, it indicated that the numbers of women who were willing to admit to engaging in premarital sexual activity had risen by more than 300%. So a lot of women were looking at this and basically saying, there's no stigma to this. We don't have to worry about the same judgmental nature of things that we did 10 years ago. So sure, what the hell, I'll tell the survey person you know, what they need to know. So this is, a, again, a very powerful symbol of how things were changing uh, culturally in the United States. Now, to kind of bring it down a little bit, we also have a revolution in human violence. Okay, The year where we start to see some of these things happening, uh, we see in 1900, Great Britain is fighting in a war in South Africa for control against the Dutch uh, and, the, uh, and the Belgians. They fight in a war called the Boer War, B-O-E-R. Uh, in, uh, in South Africa, a British officer named Horatio Kitchener uh, came up with a strategy. He rounded up 75,000 primarily women and children uh, in South Africa and confined them to camps. Now, this isn't the first time this had been done. Okay, Obviously, this had been done with Native Americans. Uh, I referenced it happening uh, in Cuba with the Spanish coming in and rounding people up. But Kitchener himself personally referred to these as concentration camps. Now, obviously, I th I'm, I'm going to presume that most of you know that the concentration camp is a hallmark of World War II activity. Uh, it obviously got this horrific uh, stigma attached to it, and rightfully so. And there's a stigma attached to it during this era as well. But the reason it's called a concentration camp is because you're concentrating large numbers of people in one spot. Okay. And Kitchener's idea is the same as the general that was in Cuba during that era. Uh, it's the same as the strategy of the Nazis uh, in creating their concentration camps. If we've got these people concentrated in these areas, they're easier to keep an eye on and make sure that they're not doing whatever the activity we don't want them doing actually is. The press is going to refer to these as concentration camps. Kitchener's going to refer to them as concentration camps, and it gets kind of embedded into our lexicon. Uh, in 1904, another term gets embedded. In the German colony of Southwest Africa, uh, again, they were fighting uh, for control of these areas, uh, except this time they're fighting for control of, uh, of this area against natives. Uh, uh, indigenous people in Southwest Africa. Uh, and what the Germans do here 
uh, the German Empire wound up rounding people up and driving them out into the desert. And when I say drive them out to the desert, I don't mean they say, let's get on this truck and we're all going to go for a ride. I mean, they're driving them like cattle ranchers would drive a herd of cows to a certain place. They're going to drive these natives out into the, uh, the deserts, the desert regions of southern Africa. They're going to bayonet people. They're going to shoot them. They're going to leave people to starve to death. And in the process, they're going to kill approximately 80,000 people in this method. And the press began referring to this as a genocide. This is the first time we see the word genocide appearing uh, in print. Now, again, this isn't the first genocide in global history. It's just the first time the word is actually being applied to one of these things. And a genocide is defined as a deliberate attempt to exterminate an entire group of people uh, on a very uh, on a fairly specific basis, whether that basis is race, whether it's religion, whether it's color, whether it's national origin, uh, indigenous status, what have you. Uh, if it's a deliberate attempt to an, to exterminate an entire group, it's referred to as a genocide. So there's this really ugly, uh, violent part uh, of the revolutions in life. There's uh, an economic revolution that's occurring during this era. In 1900, Andrew Carnegie made $23 million uh, in his uh, business, uh, which uh, was U.S. Steel. Carnegie made $23 million, and his total tax bill was zero. His total tax bill was zero. Now, the reason for this was, is if in case you don't, you're not aware of this, in this era, there was no income tax in the United States. So Carnegie could make up make as much money uh, as he possibly could. Nobody was ever going to tax him uh, for that income. Now, during that same year in 1900, the average income of a person who worked for Carnegie was $500. And that was the basic contrast in life in the United States. The haves like Andrew Carnegie, and the have-nots, the people who worked for Andrew Carnegie. Uh, the, this is why, when I told you about uh, what teenagers were doing, uh, and I told you that their income was critical, children under the age of 15 provided 20% of their family's total income pool. So their, their income, as I told you then, and I repeat to you now, their income was absolutely critical for the survival of their, of their families. And for each of the next six years, uh, in, well into that first decade of the 20th century, Andrew Carnegie is going to make 20,000 times the average salary of his workers. Now, again, that's the basic contrast of life in the United States. That's not to say there is literally no middle class, but it's the upper class and the lower class. That's it. That's the primary uh, contrast in life. Uh, Andrew Carnegie is not the only person who's doing this sort of stuff. Uh, the Vanderbilt family, which is a very famous family, uh, if you've ever heard of Vanderbilt University, for example, uh, they, are a fair, they were a fairly prominent and wealthy family that made their money in railroads in the United States in the 19th century. Uh, they spent more, they bought the family, the extended family bought just tons of houses across the United States. And they spent so much money on these homes, on building them and buying these homes, that they spent more than all of the royal families in all of Europe throughout history combined on their housing. Now, that's, that's a hell of a thing to do, to think about all of the royal families across Europe and across time and think of how much money they spent constructing palaces and, uh, and manors and all of this. And the Vanderbilts have outdone all of them combined. That's, that's just remarkable. Uh, my personal favorite out of all of this stuff uh, is the family of a guy named Bradley Martin. Uh, Bradley Martin threw a party in 1897, which just happened to be uh, a recession year in the United States. Uh, the party cost $369,000. Now that's not adjusted for inflation, that's contemporaneous. So in 1897, Martin had $369,000 to use to throw this party. And it included a 12-course meal. Uh, he had brought the Philharmonic of 
uh, the National Philharmonic of Austria in to play six songs at this party. And Martin also handed out cigars that were wrapped in $100 bills. Now, I've actually got a prop for this one. Uh, when a lot of people think of a cigar wrapped in a $100 bill, what they think of is something like you've got a cigar and somebody just took a $100 bill and wrapped it around it, okay? But that's not what's going on here. I've got a cigar here and this outer piece of tobacco is referred to as the wrapper, okay? That's what holds all of the tobacco that's been bound up and all of that stuff. It's the wrapper, that's literally what you smoke. So when Martin is handing out these cigars, quote, wrapped in $100 bills, that outer layer in place of a tobacco leaf is a $100 bill. So when they light it up, they're lighting up $100 bills. That is wealth beyond belief. That's how you demonstrate you've got a ridiculous amount of money that you're literally smoking up $100 bills. Now, on top of all of this stuff, uh, most of these wealthy families, like the families of Bradley, Martin, of Bradley Martin, of Andrew Carnegie, of you know the Nelson Rockefellers, of the, or uh, John Rockefellers of the world, the JP Morgans of the world, uh, all of these robber barons that I've talked about during this era, they've got tons of help. They've got 50 to 60 servants on staff at all times because help was incredibly cheap. They could get all of this help to do all sorts of things because help is cheap. And there's a reason why it's cheap. Uh, but we're going to look at how cheap the help actually was first. A person in those types of positions could hire a cook a personal cook or chef for $5 a week. They could hire a, a waitress uh, to wait on them for $3.50 a week. Uh, if they had a bigger family, obviously, they'd have one, more than one waitress. Uh, a cleaning woman, they could get maids for $1.50 a day. They could be custom made in their clothing uh, for $3.50 a week for a seamstress. Uh, they'd obviously also have to purchase the material, but the labor is $3.50 a week. This is incredibly low. A person could get all of this labor for about $800 a year. Now, why it's so cheap? A, an English economist named David Ricardo, he was, uh, he, was, uh, he was an economist in the 19th century. He had come up with this idea called the Iron Law of Wages to explain why wages, even in great booming economies to explain why wages will decline. And he said, he called this the iron law of wages. The iron law of wages said, all wages decline to the level that the most desperate person will accept. All wages will decline to the level that the most desperate person will accept. In the 19th century, the iron law of wages worked because people were completely immobilized. There was, even in boom economies, they were stuck, they were immobilized. Uh, but heading into the 20th century, they're not as immobile. They're not as immobilized as they had been in previous decades. But the iron law of wages still holds in the United States for two basic reasons. The iron law of wages holds for two basic reasons. Uh, the first one, the first big reason, is immigration to the United States. Now, this immigration is referred to as, quote, the new immigration. Now, before anybody starts getting worried and thinking I'm about to go off on some sort of the immigrants are taking our jobs sort of thing, that's not what's going on here. This is about pure economics. This is on some level, it's about supply and demand just applied to the labor market. Now, first, we're gonna deal with this, this issue of, quote, the new immigration, about why it's called the quote unquote new immigration. It's called the new immigration because the immigrants are coming in larger numbers from areas of, of Europe and the rest of the world. And they're coming from new places. The old immigration was immigration that was primarily from Western Europe. These were people from Ireland, from Germany, some from England, some from France but mostly Ireland and Germany. And they're coming to the United States. If you took 1301, you might remember uh, the Irish famine 
uh, that caused this massive outflow of people. Uh, but they come to the United States and they're taking jobs like ditch digging. Uh, they're working 14 hour days in industries that virtually no quote unquote native born Americans wanted to work in. And then by the 1890s, we've got a quote unquote new immigration. These immigrants are coming from Southern and Eastern Europe. They're Eastern European Jews. They're Slavic peoples, they're Italians, they're Greeks. They're coming over for some of the same reasons. Maybe uh, there might be uh, uh, agricultural problems where they're coming from. They might be fleeing political persecution. They might be fleeing natural disasters. Uh, but whatever reason they're coming to the United States, they're coming from these areas, these newer areas, and they're coming in larger and larger numbers. To give you an idea, again, in 1907, 1.7 million immigrants arrived in New York City. That's a number that has never been equaled. That was by far the largest number of immigrants who came through New York City. There were so many people of Italian descent in New York uh, that they actually outnumbered Italians in Rome, causing one newspaper editor to joke that the real capital of Italy might better uh, be New York as opposed to Rome, Italy, because there were more Italians there. But immigration also created a supply and demand issue, okay? Uh, a supply, a, a workforce supply and demand. There were a lot of workers coming in, a lot of these people who are coming in to the United States, they have to have jobs just like everybody else does. And when an employer looks at this massive amount of immigration and is trying to, you know, and being told by their employees, hey, we want raises, we want more benefits, that employer can look at that massive number of immigrants that are coming in and say, these people are desperate. I can take advantage of these people. I can lower my labor costs by going out to those newly arrived immigrants. And, you know, think about Henry Ford. Okay. Think about what Ford had done. Uh, when he's paying his workers, five dollars a day workers in other industries are going to say well we want to be paid five dollars a day too okay so another industrialist might say well i'm not going to pay you five dollars a day i've been paying you two dollars and forty cents a day and that's what i'm going to pay and if you don't like it you can quit you, you know you don't have to work here and if these people agitate and agitate and agitate he might just go well you know what tough luck you're fired where you know i'm not going to keep you guys around anymore and then that employer is going to go down to the docks, to where these immigrants are coming in, coming literally off the boats in some circumstances. This literally happens in both Boston and New York. Immigrants will be coming down these uh, the gangplanks, and these industrialists will have representatives there who are handing them cards saying, if you're looking for a job, come work for this person. And that person will tell them, hey, I know you're new here. I know you don't have a job, but I'm going to pay you a job that's going to pay you $2 a day. And by doing that, by taking these really desperate people who have nothing, you know, they've lowered their work, they've lowered their labor costs. Now notice, I didn't tell you, I didn't use in this analogy, I didn't use the same $2.40. They're not going to pay these desperate immigrants that $2.40. They're going to lowball them because they know that these immigrants are desperate. They may not have a better understanding of what the wages in the United States are. They just know that it's better than having literally no job. So industrialists and employers are going to take advantage of this situation to lower their labor costs, and it's going to keep this iron law of wages in place. It's going to have the effect of decreasing wages across the workforce in the United States. Now, a second way that the iron law of wages is going to quote unquote work if you will, in the United States, is because of the relative weakness of labor unions in the United States. By 1900, there were fewer than 1 million members in all of the unions across the United States. There just was not a large union presence in this country. Now, those who were in unions generally uh, had, uh, had it better than those who weren't in unions, but because there were smaller numbers. They just really didn't have a ton of influence on wages and benefits in this country. Now, a lot of, you know, one of the things that's strange about the United States is that unlike other countries, we don't have a huge quote unquote labor history in this country. We don't have uh, a lot of circumstances of the lower classes rising up and demanding things. Like we don't have a labor party 
in this country like there is uh, in Great Britain. Uh, and Americans are just generally, in a lot of ways, and especially in this era, were anti-labor. They, and part of it was, is that unions during this era uh, had originally had dramatic ideas about transforming American society. It wasn't coming in and just asking for more money or anything like that. Unions were talking about literally changing the way people live, that workers should have control of the factory, that workers uh, may not seize the means of production, as Karl Marx might have put it, but because they're producing all of the stuff and there is no business without what they're producing, workers should have a greater, uh, should get a greater share of the profits. So they should be more in control of that process. But by the 1880s, uh, a labor union called the American Federation of Labor had emerged as kind of the leading labor union in this country. And they had as the leader, a guy named Samuel Gompers. And Gompers kind of threw out this idea of you know, workers seizing the means of production or getting greater access uh, to the revenue. Gompers said, it's very simple what union workers should want and what we as a labor union are going to fight for. He said, we're going to fight for what he called bread and butter interests. It comes to be known as bread and butter unionism, the basics. Okay, We're going to fight for better wages and better working conditions. That's it. Forget all of this stuff about profit sharing. Forget all of this stuff about seizing the means of, of production and workers in control of the nation's economy. Forget all that stuff. We just want better wages and better working conditions. Now, Gompers also had another idea uh, that he employed through the American Federation of Labor. And that was that skilled laborers are the only ones who should be organized. They're the only ones who should be allowed to unionize. So if you've got a pin factory where sheet metal is pushed through a press and you've got press operators who either operate a, uh, a punch press or a kick press, and that presses out the pins, uh, that are being manufactured. And then you've got people who assemble the pins, people who pack up the pins, people who uh, then do all of the paperwork to make sure that the pins get sent out to consumers uh, and that money is actually coming in, that the, uh, that the, uh, that the vendors are actually paying their bills. Uh, and then you've got a group of people who sweep up at night. Gompers is gonna say, uh, the only people that should be unionized are the people who actually uh, are the press operators, because it takes a little bit of skill to do that. And another group that I haven't mentioned, the mechanics, the guys who fix the machinery. And the reason is, is if, if, if you've got people who feed sheet metal into those presses, an employer could reasonably say, well, I don't need to do much training to teach somebody to feed sheet metal through. It doesn't take a ton of training to teach people to take pin, pinhead, and put the pinhead on top, but it does take a lot of training and a lot of work and a lot of knowledge to work on these machines. If all of our machines break down and we don't have any mechanics, we're screwed. So Gomper says, because of that type of power, only the mechanics and maybe only the press operators should be unionized. The rest of these people, forget them. It doesn't take any special effort to do what they're doing. So we don't want them. This basically, this mindset basically guaranteed that labor unions would be small. And that meant that there would be very few wage gains, very few concessions from management. And it would also mean that the iron law of wages would have another sort of post that propped it up uh, to keep it uh, in place in the American workforce. Uh, now, a final factor in all of this, a final factor uh, in the uh, in the iron law of way in keeping the iron law of wages working, uh, and in terms of the revolutionary revolutionary nature of the 20th century, is a new type of corporation. The rise of the modern corporation is at once uh, an effort to keep the iron law of wages in place and to also alter the way we think in the United States. Uh, now. Two lectures ago, I talked about the election of 1896 and the consequences. And one of the triumphs, uh, or one of the consequences, was the triumph of corporate capitalism. And this led directly, the rise of corporate capitalism led directly 
to the modern corporation. So if corporate capitalism triumphs, then the modern corporation is going to triumph as well here. And this is as fundamental a change as anything that we've seen in this country. Whether you realize it or not, power in this country is built around institutions. There are moments of grassroots power. There are moments of grassroots political power, for example. But whether we like to admit it, institutions are a big part of this. And one of the most important, this is one of, the, one of those even uh, more difficult things for a lot of Americans to actually come to grasp with or come to terms with and say, yeah, it's true, we, we have to admit it, is that the most important decisions in our country made by institutions are actually made by the institution of corporations. Corporations are the ones that make the decisions about where factories get built uh, or how many jobs get created, how many jobs get eliminated, what jobs get outsourced, uh, how many people are going to get hired, how many people are going to get fired. They bid on government contracts. So even when the government does get in the business of creating jobs, these private corporations bid on those contracts. So uh, the private corporation or the modern corporation is a huge institution and a huge institutional change. It's a fundamental shift in how society is organized in the United States. Now, while I keep referencing a lot of this stuff, some of you might be thinking that I'm one of those you know, typical quote unquote liberal professors who goes corporations bad, always bad. But I'm gonna tell you here that there is some good and some bad to all of this. Uh, as we're gonna see with a lot of things in the United States uh, throughout our past, there's both good and bad. So the good, right off the bat, if we look at the period between 1890 and 1929, the average work week in the United States actually decreased by one and a half days. The, it was not uncommon for people to work seven days a week, but it was far more un, it was far more common for people to work at least six days a week. Uh, and by the time 1929 rolls around, it's way more common for people to work Monday through Friday. Monday through Friday becomes the standard work week in the United States. And that is unquestionably good. Okay. One of the things that happens, one of the reasons this happens, is that modern corporations employed efficiency experts, and these efficiency experts said people are more efficient working five days a week than they are six and seven days a week. So got to find a way to get to a five-day work week. Average wages in the United States in that same period, 1890 to 1929, average real wages, meaning that we take into account cost of living, that we take into account uh, things like the inflation rate in the United States, average real wages increased 300% in that 39-year period from 1890 to 1929. By 1929, most Americans had conveniences and luxuries that were previously inconceivable to them. 90% of Americans by 1929 had electricity and indoor plumbing. Now think about what a life changer that would be. I mean, today in 2022, many of us probably don't think about that stuff. We probably take it for granted that if we get up in the middle of the night and have to, you know, if we go to the kitchen or if we go answer the call of nature, you know, all we got to do is flip on a switch. We got a lit pathway and we can go take care of that uh, in full light. And then when it's over with, you know, when we're done, we can go, you know, turn the light off and go back to bed. But think about a person in 1890. Uh, who is living in one of these cities who, in, if they have to answer the call of nature in the middle of the night, they've got to light up a candle to guide their way when they get to their backyard because they're going to have to go outside since they don't have indoor plumbing. They're going to have to go to an outhouse, probably. Uh, if they do that, they're going to have to go out to their backyard. They're going to have to go along a guide, wa a, a gu a guide wire of sorts, a rope that connects the outhouse to uh, a post on their back porch and they've got that guide wire so that they don't get uh, they don't step in holes, they don't get off track or anything like that, so that they can get out there, take care of business, and then come back in. It's a long, drawn-out process as compared to turning on the light, walking down the hallway, and it's over and done with in two minutes. 
Okay, that's a revolutionary change in people's lives, whether we like to think of it or not. So this change in having indoor plumbing and electricity being standard is remarkable. 90% of Americans were going uh, to the movies every single week by 1929. They've got the leisure time and the ability uh, to afford to demand entertainment. They're willing to pay to be entertained. We also see infant mortality dropping uh, by two thirds in the United States. And while there is a scientific development that we talked about uh, before pasteurization, that pasteurization gets out to the United States courtesy of things like corporate development. Corporations are going to put, uh, put it into the process uh, of dairy farming and they're gonna be responsible for getting it out there uh, to the people. Uh, it's all sparked by growth. It's all sparked by the rise of the modern corporation. But there's a downside to some of this. There is a bad. Uh, unsafe working conditions were the norm during this era. 50,000 people every single year uh, died on the job. Lots of people uh, who were in uh, railroad, the railroad industry, for example, uh, lost an arm or a leg. One out of every 30 lost an arm or a leg. It was not uncommon in meat processing, uh, the meat processing industry, for people to lose fingers uh, as they're processing meat. It was not uncommon for people to fall into processors uh, and get killed in that way. Uh, so it was incredibly unsafe to be a laborer in the United States in at this turn of the century era and during this early age of the modern corporation. Uh, given that we've talked about the breaking of unions over and over again, it should not be a surprise for you to know that workers overwhelmingly were barred from organizing in unions or uh, representing their interests collectively. They just could not do that uh, during this era. Uh, also, corporations and, and the wealthy bribed the government for favorable legislation. One of my favorite robber barons, quote, if you want to say you've got a favorite robber baron, that's something only a history nerd would say. Uh, but one of my favorite robber barons was a guy named, uh, uh, and I'm blanking on his name as much as I just said that he's my favorite uh, robber baron. His name was Jay Gould. Jay Gould had just testified to a committee before Congress uh, and had literally offered them money to provide favorable legislation for, for his business. Uh, he was in the railroad industry. And when he came out and reporters were asking him about, well, how could you be so blatant about offering bribes like this? Gould's answer was just remarkably honest. He said, what is the point in being wealthy if you can't get the government to do what you want it to do? Okay, He would fit in perfectly uh, in the mo in the modern business industry, so uh, uh, or modern business environment, so corporations were doing this all the time during the turn of the century era, and businesses were also polluting the environment with virtually no government oversights on all of this. So between 1890 and 1929, there is a an unbelievable growth in the American economy, but it's also happening at an incredible cost. So the obvious question is. Why? How do these new corporations emerge? Well, if you read textbooks, uh, this is one of the reasons I don't typically like textbooks, is that one of their arguments is, is that, well, it's just a natural occurrence. It's the evolution of corporations, if you will, that bigger is better, and that, you know, uh, people, you know, just kind of one day it clicked and the light went on over their head, they just realized, well, we've got to do, we've got to have bigger companies. But that doesn't just happen. It's not sort of a natural evolutionary process. These people are looking at corporations and noting that there's bigger corporations, that they do absolutely have more money, but they're not thinking about the why that actually happens. In 1870, the largest corporations in the United States were only worth about a million dollars, and they had very limited uh, operational areas. But by the 1890s, Standard Oil uh, had hit six, 600 million uh, in capitalization. U.S. Steel would follow that by 1896. They would be capitalized at a billion dollars. They're the first billion dollar corporation. Uh, and they're also, uh, as we see, as we're going to see here uh, with these other bullet points, they are structured differently and they are uh, operating on a wholly different uh, geographic scale. So it's not just a matter of these people got together and went, oh, bigger is better. That's, that's way too simple. Okay. First of all, remember I mentioned to you that efficiency experts 
were employed by these large corporations. And efficiency experts would come in when companies were starting to capitalize, when they'd offer stock in their companies and say, you know, we're going to offer stock because we need more money to engage in this massive type of expansion we're thinking of. Well, efficiency experts would come in and point out to them that, well, now you've got a lot more money at stake. You've got a lot more territory at stake. The people who own this company are not, you know, the guy who owned in the previous example I've used here, the guy who owned the pin factory, for example, uh, or, or even Henry Ford. Henry Ford may be the most important guy at the Ford Motor Company, but he's not the only owner. The shareholders are the owners of that company. So in the 1870s and the 1880s, and, you know, and, and, and into today, there are companies where the owner and the manager, the people who manage the day-to-day -day operations, are the same people. But by the 1890s, we're starting to see more and more that the owners are the investors, the shareholders. And there's a separate class of managers. There's a separate group of people that are hired as managers to come in and run the day-to-day -day operations of whatever the industry is. Now, the best example I can give you of something like this is to think of the difference between, say, a Circle K shop and an HEB, okay? The person who owns that Circle K, the franchisee that owns that Circle K, they are going to come in, they're going to open the doors every day, they're going to make sure the coffee's brewing, they're going to make sure the shelves are stocked, that uh, the lights are on, that there's gas in the, uh, in the gas pumps, they're going to make sure the bathrooms are clean, they're going to pull stock from the stock room and make sure the shelves are good to go. They're going to make sure that there's money in the cash register and all of that. And while they may have people working for them, I don't want to suggest to you that the same person is at the store 24 seven. That person that owns that store is ultimately the one responsible. They're controlling and managing what happens day to day. They make sure all of that stuff is done. And then at the end of the day, they make sure that the deposit to the bank has been made, that the cash register doesn't have so much cash that somebody's going to throw a brick through the window uh, and try to steal it out of the register. They're going to make sure that everything's shut down uh, and that the doors are locked and that if necessary, that the, you know, the shutters are pulled around it and all that sort of stuff. They're ultimately running everything day to day. They're in charge of all of that. But think about an HEB. An HEB store, there's a store manager to be sure, but that store manager even, that store manager doesn't go out and run the registers when there's uh, a necessity uh, for more registers to be open. They don't even make the call. They probably got a line manager that has responsibility for the cash registers and says, okay, well, there's more business, so we need to get five more cashiers to the front. That store manager doesn't personally stock the shelves day to day. They've got a lines manager that says, okay, we've got stock workers who go to the back and pull stock out over the course of the day and make sure that the shelves are, are full. And we've got other groups of managers who make sure that the store is clean on a daily basis. We've got another group of manager, another manager that makes sure that inventory is taken properly and that inventory is being reported properly. And then there's a whole other level of managers above the store manager. There are district managers and regional managers and boards of directors, and obviously shareholders too, okay? So the persons who own the company are not the ones who are day-to-day -day involved in the running of the business. There's a whole separation between the management level and the ownership management, sorry, the ownership level. These companies also operate on a geographic scale. In the 1870s, most, most companies operated on a regional scale. They didn't have the ability to operate on a national scale. The idea of, for example, the example I'm using here is a cracker, uh, is cracker companies, uh, the American Biscuit Company, the New York Biscuit Company, and the United States Biscuit Company. They made crackers. It was inconceivable for the New York, all three of these operated in, in New York State, by the way. But all, not one of those companies had the idea that they could sell crackers in San Francisco, California, or Spokane, Washington, or Houston, Texas. None of them had 
that notion that they could actually do that because they didn't have the ability to transport crackers. They didn't have the technological ability to make sure that the crackers could even be fresh, even if they could put them on a railroad and get them to Houston, Texas. They didn't have any sort of technology that would allow those things to be fresh by the time they got to Houston. So they operated, these cracker companies operated on regional levels. But starting in the 1890s, they took advantage of things like a transcontinental railroad. They took advantage of new packaging techniques uh, that would allow for uh, what we today call zip, uh, zip sealing. Uh, or removal of the air from a uh, from an airlocked bag, uh, from an airtight bag. These companies were starting to notice that there was there was now the possibility to operate on a broader scale than just you know kind of the the basic area where they existed. But what they needed was more money to do this. They needed to have greater capitalization to buy fleets of trucks to. Uh, expand production to buy the new types of equipment that allow them to seal stuff airtight. So the American, New York, and United States Biscuit Companies merged to become a single company called the National Biscuit Company, or Nabisco, which would allow them to take advantage of these, not only their greater capitalization, their bigger size, but take advantage of the technology advances and to take advantage of the transportation advances so that they could actually do all of this stuff so that the crackers that you make in say Syracuse, New York could actually be sold in San Francisco, California or Houston, Texas for that matter. Now these companies also, these new corporations also engaged uh, in uh, a greater sense of integration. Now, uh, when I say integration here, I don't mean racial integration. I'm talking about their business practices. They do a lot of different things. Uh, before Andrew Carnegie came along and consolidated the steel industry into the company that was U.S. Steel, uh, most steel companies only made one type of steel. Well, once Carnegie gets all of this stuff together, U.S. Steel starts making all sorts of different types of steel. They process these different types of steel. Meat companies like Armor and Swift began processing all different kinds of meats. They also owned packaging operations so that they didn't have to outsource that. They owned printing operations so that they could not only have their own cans to pack stuff in, but they could also have their own printer print up their labels. They bought fleets of trucks so that they didn't have to rely on an outside company to transport what they're, uh, what they're processing. So they're integrating all of their levels. The term that economists use for this is vertical integration. They're integrating all of their operations as opposed to doing things piecemeal and then sending it out to a third party vendor. So these new corporations are different. They appear as a solution for competition. That's what they're doing. All of these things that are happening here are designed to deal with a massive amount of competition. Now, there was probably no worse time to be in business from a competition standpoint than heading into the 1890s. There were 1,500 different railroad companies at one point. That's why I mentioned to you in that first lecture that you know those 12 guys owning one half of the railroad track mileage in the South, that's a huge thing, okay? Because there's 1,500 different rail companies railroad companies. There were almost 450 different steel companies in the United States during this period. And they're all trying to reach the same marketplace and reach the same company customers. And they all realize there's too much competition. So how do we get rid of competition? Well, they look for ways to eliminate competition and they come up with three methods to do that. And the three methods are pools or cartels, trusts, and holding, holding companies. We're gonna talk about each one of these in turn, pools or cartels, trusts and holding companies. Now understand that these are just basic uh, skimming the surface definitions. There's a lot more that goes into all of these definitions, but for a basic history class, this is really all you're gonna to need to know about pools and cartels, trusts and holding companies. But they're all designed to avoid and eliminate competition and create a more stable marketplace for those companies. Now, the first one is the pool or cartel. A pool is a voluntary agreement among competing companies 
to fix prices and divide markets. So a bunch of different companies that are engaged in the same industry are going to say, okay, we're all going to get together and we're all going to just have a sort of gentleman's agreement that this company can sell processed meat here. Company B, you can sell processed meat here. Company C, you can sell processed meat here. Company D, over here. And on and on, you get the idea. None of those companies can encroach on the other's territory. So company B cannot come along and say, ah, the hell with it. I think I'm going to go over and sell processed meat in company A's territory. They can't do that, okay? Because they've all agreed, we're going to fix, we're going to set the market. We're going to divide the marketplace up, but we're also going to fix prices. And we're going to fix prices as a way of saying, there's no advantage to you, the corporation, to come into company A's territory and try to sell there. OPEC is a modern example. That's exactly what they're doing with oil. It's about setting production quotas, dividing up the marketplace, fixing a price so that nobody gets an advantage over anybody else. The problem here is twofold. And I, one of the problems I actually don't have on the screen here, but the problem is, is this doesn't really give consumers much advantage or much choice in all of this stuff. If the price is the same in region A, B, C, D, and E, then there's no reason for them to seek out competition. There's nothing, uh, there's nothing that's going to give them any benefit to that. So it hurts consumers ultimately. Uh, but it also has this other problem that the temptation to cheat is too great amongst those corporations that have agreed because it is, after all, only a voluntary agreement. There's not, there isn't paperwork, there isn't a contract that says you can't do this or we're going to kick you out or anything like that. The problem with pools and cartels is, is that the companies themselves often cheat on these agreements, which ultimately does give the consumer some uh, minor benefit. Uh, but in the end, it always winds up hurting the industry. And that's kind of one of the problems that OPEC winds up having all of the time in the oil industry. Uh, they'll, their member nations will constantly uh, break their voluntary agreement to do things for political expediency. For example, uh, Venezuela in 2007 uh, was selling heating oil in the United States, even though by this agreement OPEC, with OPEC, they were prohibited from doing this, but it was beneficial to make a political point for Venezuela to sell this oil, this heating oil in the United States, because it made uh, George W. Bush look bad. So Hugo Chavez was perfectly happy to do this sort of stuff. So uh, the temptation to cheat is just too great with these pools and cartels. Now, the next area or the next option, if you will, is what's called a trust. Now, this is different than a pool or a cartel in that there is an actual agreement this time, a written agreement. The competing businesses, the competing companies give control of their business over to a board of trustees. This is a very formal legal agreement. And then that board of trustees, hence the term trust, runs each one of those company, or they run all of those comp competitors as if it were a single entity. Now they do the same sort of things. They create marketplace, they divide it up, they set prices, they set production quotas, they do all of the same things. But if a company violates it, they're out. And then all of the member companies are going to kind of band together to crush that other company. So there is more of a benefit to the companies. The companies do actually wind up exerting a whole lot more control over this sort of stuff. But as again, you can probably figure out here, this means very little consumer choice. The people who get hurt in all of this are consumers. And ultimately the federal government concluded the same thing. And I think it was 1894. In 1894, Congress passed something called the Sherman Antitrust Act, which forbid these types of arrangements. Now, the last type of agreement is something called the holding company, a holding company. Now, a holding company does not actually produce or quote unquote do anything. We often like to think of these holding companies as manufacturers or something like that, but they're really not. Uh, the modern corporation, General Motors Corp, for example, GMC, they don't actually manufacture 
cars. They own companies that do that type of manufacturing. But General Motors Corp is the holding company that owns Chevrolet and Cadillac uh, and, and, and a handful of other companies that produce all of these cars. Okay, The Chevrolet Corporation is the, one of those companies that produces it under the banner of General Motors. The same with a company like Citicorp. Citicorp's most famous uh, institution is Citibank. Okay, but Citicorp is not a bank. Citicorp is a holding company that owns a bunch of financial institutions, both banks and insurance companies and mortgage originators and uh, stock investment, uh, stock and investment corporations. They own all of that stuff under one big umbrella corp, Citicorp, but the company Citicorp itself doesn't actually engage in those types of things. Now, you might be thinking to yourself, well, this sounds like it's just an elaborate way to get around trust. And you would be right. That's exactly why these are developed, why holding companies are developed. They are designed to do the same things trusts do, decrease the market size, decrease the number of competitors in the marketplace and have control over that marketplace while still offering quote, some quote unquote consumer choice. Okay, the line between holding company and uh, and trust is as thin as this piece of paper that I'm holding up. Okay, that's why the Justice Department spends a lot of time in in investigating antitrust activities. They'll get they'll investigate companies and conclude you say you're a holding company, but you're actually a trust. So you have to divest in certain companies so that there is actual true consumer choice. So the consumer is actually being served here. But again, all of these are designed to divide up the marketplace and to uh, set prices. And they wind up literally transforming the national economy. They transform the American economy in a very important way. What winds up getting created here, we don't have a monopoly. Okay, we don't have monopolies in various industries, and we don't have a monopoly overall in the economy. What develops here in uh, the United States corporate capitalist order is what's called a financial oligopoly. There are a handful of companies uh, that are making these types of decisions. There's not, a, there's not the same you know, 1,500 railroad companies or 446 different steel companies or, you know, 150 different oil companies. There's eight oil companies that are making all of the decisions. And there's a handful of steel corporations and a handful of meat processors and all that sort of stuff. So it winds up consolidating and on some level kind of transforming and constricting the national economy. Now, this has another important effect. It's this transformed nature of the economy that also creates a massive economic boom heading into the 20th century. And it's in the context of that economic boom that the United States becomes a world power. So when we come back for lecture six, we're gonna be discussing how the United States becomes a world power uh, and what the consequences of becoming a world power are. So come back for lecture six uh, and we'll have a little bit more of this stuff.